ลมมาจะโลกที่ปฏิสหมปฏิกัดอันเฉลีอันที่วารังอายาจะทาสันติทัสตตาปารชาคาชาติกาเทเสตุธรรมอนุกรรมปิมังปะชังนโมทัสสะปะกวัตโตอะระหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตตัสสะนโมทัสสะปะกวัตโตอะระหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตตัสสะนโมทัสสะปะกวัตโตอะระหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตตัสสะบุตังดามังสังกังนามาสัมมิถ้าใครมีอยากจะเปลี่ยนสภาพร่ Was unable, like to all this talk of perception of light, and don't you don't have to look around to see because there's no right answer to this. But who here was just flummoxed, or you couldn't? This talk of light just didn't make any sense. You can raise your hand. Okay, okay. There are a couple of hands. That's great. Um, so for those people and anybody else who maybe just didn't feel bold enough to raise your hand. Um, Thought to start off, just giving you a fact, a fact, um, not about perception of light, but just about, um, yeah. Even if the rest of the talk sucks or is uninteresting, then at least you've learned one fact about the world. So this fact I learned recently, um, it's my second word in Russian. I know two words in Russian, and my first word is a curse word I learned in first grade, and I won't tell you that one. Um, But the second one is the Russian word for alarm clock. Does anybody here speak Russian? Or yeah, all right. So, you, well, there might be more than one, but the one I'm thinking of is budilnik. Yes, all right. Um, so budilnik is the Russian word for uh, alarm clock, and it's cognate. That means it it relates to linguistically the Pali and Sanskrit word root bud, which means to wake up, the same as as the Buddha. So, we can take the the Buddha as our alarm clock, that which kind of wakes us up and brings light into our practice. So, Buddhic. So, all right. Hopefully, the rest of the talk you can walk out any time if uh, things get boring. But um, yet, the Buddha did talk about this uh, perception of light, um, and I'll be just giving a few of the similes that he talked about, and maybe. Saying some of the the Pali words which he used, and maybe elaborating on on some of the different meanings there. Um, he talked about it in quite a few different places, using different Pali words for the word light. And it's rather fascinating that he didn't go more deeply. He didn't describe it more deeply. Actually, what this this practice was, where it comes up most frequently, is in relationship to the. Mental habit of sloth and torpor, or tina mita, this contraction and darkening of the mind, um, and this is a mind state which it's usually translated as one of the five hindrances, and it's usually translated as sloth and torpor, which are pretty extreme words. And uh, but it really does cover the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of just our unawareness. So when the mind, when we just go on autopilot. All of the degrees of autopilot—that's the darkness. That's the um, yeah. This tina mita, this sloth and torpor in its kind of minor manifestation. And the Buddha 
prescribed for this Tina Mitta, for this sloth and torpor, for this, this apathy and autopilot mode, just the perception of light, the aloka sanya. And he said that we can practice it as if what is in front is the same as what's behind, as what is above is the same as what is below, as what is below is the same as what is above, as the nighttime is the daytime, and, and as the daytime is the nighttime. So basically it's a perception that is spherical. It goes all around and it is unlimited. Um, so we can practice it in that way and it's something to look at in our own practice. Um, I introduced in that uh, introductory meditation a couple of ways that we can direct our mind in ways that are like light. So that flashlight awareness. This is oftentimes just how we're interacting with other people. We're interacting with the world. We've got this very narrow bandwidth or nar narrow kind of circle that we're, this sphere of awareness is rather limited what we're, we're taking in. Um, and there's a shadow all around that. Um, there's the light, which we're paying attention to, but then there's all of that which is not really included within our awareness when we're keeping things limited in that way. Uh, the first two ver verses of the Dhammapada are um, all things, all Dhammas are originating in the mind. They have mind as the source, they have mind as the chief, they're all mind made. If one speaks or acts with a mind that is corrupted, then suffering will follow one as the wheel, the hoof of the ox. That's the first verse. The second verse is, all things are preceded by mind. They're all mind made, and they all have mind as their chief. If one speaks or acts with a bright mind, a light mind, a pasana mind, then happiness or sukha will follow one like a shadow that never leaves. And I've loved that verse and have ch chanted it in Pali uh, many, many times. Um, and it, the meaning of it seems to, to change and just mature. Um, and yeah, think about that. What does that mean? That if one speaks or acts with a bright mind, a light mind, then happiness or pleasure even can follow one like a shadow that never leaves. One way that I've experimented with this, this perception, this, this insight, this, this verse, is that it's the light inside of us. It's the inner light. And we're, yeah, there's this, we're casting this, this light all around us. And if we're awake and paying attention and, um, yeah, bring some degree of mindfulness to our lives, then this lightness just goes out in every direction. And then if we're the light, then everything that we see is also a light. And the, the shadow, this coolness, and especially in, uh, in India still today, you want coolness. Um, say in a northern climate, perhaps like Seattle in the winter when you've got seasonal affective disorder and you're just totally ready to get rid of uh, all the clouds forever. Um, we don't necessarily like the shade, but in India it's always, it's a nice thing. Um, it's coolness. There's this coolness there. And that's the, the happiness that when we come with this, this bright mind, then this coolness will come in its wake. We practice brightness in the present moments, present moment, and then this coolness will come, just like a shadow that never leaves. And we don't even have to worry about the, the coolness, the Buddha says. Um, we just put in the cause. We just bring the brightness right now. And that's all we can do. And that's one way um, that the mind can be, uh, yeah, be, uh, be lamp-like. In the, the Buddha's final discourse, um, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha also said specifically that you should make the Dhamma your Deepa, or that can be translated as either your island or your lamp. So make the Dhamma your lamp, or even make yourself, make yourself your lamp, your own lamp. Be a lamp unto yourself. And in Buddhism, 
as most people know, we usually talk about not self, that there is this, yeah, you keep looking for a self in anything, any aspect of body and mind, and it's elusive. Um, yeah, take that as a koan. Can you find uh, a self that's always there? Uh, but here the Buddha is saying, make yourself a lamp. Make a lamp unto yourself. Make a lamp unto yourself. So how can we, how can we do this? And this brings up uh, another question, which I think is quite fascinating, is, is awareness, is mindfulness, is it, if it is a light, if it is a lamp, is it like an on-off switch? You just on-off, or is it a dimmer switch? Is awareness, is it an on-off switch, or is it a dimmer switch? Or is it both? Is it one of those kind of cool dimmer switches where you can like turn it and it you know, goes up or down, and you can like press it and it, uh, it goes off, uh, and then turn it on and it goes on? Um, or is it neither? Um, and I think different schools of Buddhism, different teachers will take very clear different points uh, or takes on that question. Um, it might be if there's a very conservative or traditional Theravada teacher. Theravada is this gradual, we're famous for the gradualness of the Theravada path. The Buddha said just as the ocean has a gradual uh, incline, the beach just gradually goes down, the ocean just gradual like that, uh, so too is the path gradual. It's a gradual path. And so that would, you know, you could see a, a very traditional Theravada teacher saying, obviously, mindfulness is a dimmer switch. Uh, it's just a dimmer switch. We get better and better and have more and more capacity for mindfulness. You can't just go full light. Our capacity, just go full enlightenment, full brightness right now. Um, that's a take. You know, you can't just, can't do that. The path is gradual. I only have so much capacity right now based on my causes and conditions. Even when I'm most mindful in this present moment, it might just be a little speck. It might just be a little firefly uh, compared to the light of the Buddha or the awareness of, you know, the complete capacity of awareness and, and mindfulness. Or you might have a teacher in a more uh, direct or non-dual school say, no, the mind and awareness and mindfulness, it's just an on-off switch. Either you have it in the present moment, here it is, or there it's not. When you've got any moment of not being aware, forgetting your object of mindfulness, uh, forgetting to be kind, forgetting your precepts, forgetting to be generous, these are all things on the Buddhist path and they're all objects of, of mindfulness. Um, when you forget that, then the mindfulness isn't there, the light is off. And then as soon as you remember these things, you bring awareness, and that's a moment of awakening. That's the on-off switch. Uh, myself, I find that option of the cool dimmer switch that can both dim and go on and off to be quite helpful. It's like as we practice, we only can start where we're starting. You know, the, the dimness, the brightness, or the non-brightness of our, our inner light, uh, our capacity to, to know and be awake and feel bright, it can only be what it can be in any given moment. Um, and we're training that. I mean, hopefully, uh, I've got more capacity for the world, more capacity for spaciousness for the world, each of us does, than when we started meditating, when we started our spiritual practice and conceiving of the world as more than just, just us. Um, yeah, hopefully our, our dimmer switch is slowly moving up. And throughout our day, we have these dimmers. You know, we've got, for me, I'm a lark uh, as opposed to a night owl. Ajahn Nisibo and I are the same. We wake up super early. If you're thinking of a time right now, chances are we wake up earlier than that. Um, but we go to bed super early, super early. If you're thinking of a time, it's almost certainly earlier than that too. Um, but we love the morning. That's our that's our, our brightest times, and it's throughout the day. It feels as if our lightness, our capacity for awareness and brightness just diminishes. At least certainly that's the case with me. Um, I've read about this uh, concept of ego depletion. 
So this is a concept I think popularized and maybe coined by Roy Baumeister in this book called Willpower. And the concept there, uh, which has been, there's a lot of research for it, and there's some research that it's not totally uh, the full truth of the human psyche. But the idea of, um, of ego depletion is that, uh, say, after we've woken up or after we've had a meal, we've had some glucose go into the brain, go into the body, then we have a capacity for making good choices. You know, say we know what we want to do with our day. We've got the different habits and things that we want to do. We've got the things on our to-do list that we want to do. We know that we don't want to do this bad habit and we do want to do this good habit. And we have a capacity for that. That changes throughout the day. But as, our, as Roy Baumeister would propose, our glucose goes down, we become more sleepy, start becoming sleep deprived, and our capacity for following through with our determinations, for keeping up with our ego, egoic goals, doing our good habits, not doing our bad habits, that depletes. And I think that's probably most people's experience um, through the course of a day. But it's not the total truth. You can always muster some sense of willpower at any point of the day and be like, oh, you know, I'm feeling tired, but actually I'm still going to work out. I'm still going to not eat the things that I don't want to eat. I'm still going to not say the mean things to my partner that part of me wants to say, even though a lot of me wants to say it and I'm tired and I haven't eaten or whatever. So it's not the total truth, but similarly, I think this pattern goes with... Um, haven't totally come up with a good name for it, but awareness depletion. So another name for that ego depletion is decision fatigue. It's decision fatigue. I make so many decisions during the day, in my morning, and then at some point, I've just made so many that's like, I'm done. You know, I'm just going to give in. Whatever the mind wants to do, my old habits, I'm just going to follow along. So this uh, awareness fatigue, awareness depletion. And there's some seeming some seeming truth to that as well. You wake up, or if you're a night person, in the evening, you do your meditation and the mind is bright. And you feel like you've got this reserve, you've been practicing it, you've opened your window. It's as, as if your heart were a sol solar panel. You've been opening up that aperture for the, the sunlight to come in, and you've been getting recharged during your period of meditation. And then when the period's over, you've got all this energy, awareness is there, and uh, things feel spacious, and I don't say the things to the people that I don't want to say, and I can have this capacity for loving kindness and brightness, and it feels like that, but throughout the day, that kind of high, that brightness that comes from our meditation diminishes. Similarly, with like a retreat, after you, if you've sat, you know, a three-day retreat or a 10-day retreat, or if you know other people who have sat three-day retreats, 10-day retreats, month-long retreat, 45-day retreat, 60-day retreat, 90-day retreat. It's like yourself or the other person is like supercharging that battery. It's almost like it's like a lighthouse awareness. And it's like if you've got your, your friend goes on this 90-day retreat and you see him across the room and they're kind of you know, facing that other way and you tap on their shoulder and they turn around and it's like the lighthouse just beams. It's almost like a... You'd have like a fog horn, like, Mawr. and then you just, you know, super bright smile, and uh, it can feel like this, the brightness of the mind from, from not going outwards. Um, there's a beautiful teaching by uh, Lumpudun, Lumpudun Atulo, who takes the, he's a Thai teacher, uh, passed away um, late 1900s, um, but he reformulates the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths, you've got the truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, which is craving, the cessation of suffering, which is getting rid of that craving, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. He switched it around, has the second Noble Truth first, and the fourth Noble Truth third. So he says, uh, the mind that goes out is the cause of suffering, and the result of the mind going out is suffering. So the mind that goes out, the second noble truth, is the cause of suffering. The fruit of that is suffering. When the mind goes out, which is what most of us, honestly, are doing most of the time. We're just uh, constantly going out, like looking at all the beautiful things and like beautiful people and listening to all the great, you know, 
everything, you know, just um, letting all of our energy just um, go out. And there's nothing, that, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. But when um, we don't keep that inner, inner light alive, um, then we feel depleted. That's ego depletion. That's awareness depletion that we feel. Um, but when Pudun continued, the mind seeing the mind is the path to the end of suffering. And the fruit of that is the ending of suffering. So the mind that goes out is the cause of suffering. The result of the mind going out is suffering. The mind seeing the mind is the, the path to the end of suffering. And the fruit of the mind seeing the mind is the complete ending of suffering, the third noble truth. So that's beautiful. And that's what we're hopefully doing with meditation is just, yeah, keeping that uh, light of awareness uh, on um, and paying attention to it. And yeah, that, it has a seeming, I say it has a seeming appearance, this seeming uh, awareness depletion, because in any moment too, <laughs> any moment that we're able to be aware and to remember explicitly and specifically the truth of not self, actually, there's no tiny ego, even though I, you know, reaffirm it and kind of think about it and think through it most of the time, most days, um, relate to the world through this ego story that I have. And when I'm looking at other people and talking to other people, they're kind of reinforcing that with their looks and their stories about me. Um, <laughs> when I realize that that's just an illusion that I've created, um, in any moment that you do that, this awareness, um, yeah, that's the light switch going on. And the capacity that I'm able, the depth to which I'm able to see that truth of not self, that's how bright the light is, is on. Um, and that's, yeah, I could, my lamp, my light, our lights can only be on, can only be as bright as they can be. But on, off, you know, there it is, one moment. And even in a moment of seeming darkness, when you've got mind states of greed and anger and confusion and jealousy, and you fill in the blank, um, you know, all of the things which are just less than optimal and are, are kind of ugly, both when we see them in ourselves and when we see them in other people, uh, those, those characteristics which just aren't, aren't our brightest, when you know them, that's turning on the light. Yeah, knowing them. This is the third foundation of mindfulness. Mind knowing mind, ardent, alert, and mindful. Putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. We bring light to the situation right then and there. So that's some lamp light. I've gotten talked a little bit about uh, flashlight awareness, lamp awareness. We've got this skylight awareness. This is a practice which you find in Tibetan tradition. It's just sky gazing. And this is just <laughs> a really useful trick, is that most of the time it does feel like I'm going out. My eyes, there's some like little me behind the eyes, maybe in the brain, going out and interacting with the world. I'm somehow creating the light outside of me. But just to realize the physics of light, that everything that I see is actually just the sun's light reflecting off of everything and coming back into the eye. I don't need to do anything to have my visual apparatus work. I don't need to do anything. You can just relax your pupils and relax all those, the orbicular oralis, I think of these, these tight little sphincters around our eyes that just kind of tighten up and you can just relax. Like, I don't need to be doing that. Um, it seems like they go on autopilot sometimes um, and just contract and constrict, but yeah, I can just receive the world. And if you are able to go to the top of a mountain and just look at the sky, 360 degree light, and just take it all in, it's a beautiful way to receive the world. And you can do that. You can learn to do that anytime, right here in the middle of Skinner Auditorium. I was the one who turned on the lights, and I was unimpressed, actually, especially I knew I was giving a talk on light, and I thought there would be more, honestly. Um, fortunately, we've got the disco ball, which helps to some extent. Um, but yeah, if you can, you can take the insights gained from the brightness of looking out into an expanse, looking out into, into space and realize that we don't 
<laughs> our awareness, our focus even, you can train your focus rather than being on someone else's face. You can actually focus on the space anywhere between you and that person. Learning how to focus on space. Why don't you do that? You can. You can. We're just, we focus on the surfaces of the world, and that's just our habit. But you don't have to do that. You can train yourself actually. Uh, yeah, my hand, you can just experiment. You don't have to do it now if you're afraid of looking weird. But I'm looking at my hand, and it's about, you know, a foot and a half, two feet away from me. And my eyes, my pupils are focused at that distance, and I move it down, and my eyes are still focused at that area of space right here. <laughs> and that can just be, it can help you diffuse your stories about other people in the world when you're not overly um, attached to uh, other people's reactions and the stories that you tell about their stories about you. So that skylight awareness, this inner light awareness, there's some fascinating words in psychology or even uh, not quite physics, but physiology. The word for when you close your eyes and you see all this play of this fireworks or kind of tie-dye of light, that has a name. It's called phosphine, this, this light. Another word for it is a German word, two German words, eigenlicht. Eigen is one's own, licht is light. So eigenlicht. The color and the shapes that I see when my eyes are closed, that you see when your eyes are closed, that's eigenlicht. That's your own light. That's the name for this, this experience. Um, and it's something that, yeah, they've done all sorts of studies. You put yourself in a totally sensory deprived room, total darkness, still you'll see light. And that's rather fascinating. And then just going to the inner light. What is the inner light? What is the mind's light? And this is, yeah, if you can't, if talk during the meditation about focusing on a light uh, doesn't make sense to you, then hopefully at least the metaphor of the mind as light, of consciousness as light, that which, you know, a lot of, there's no very clear and um, satisfying definition of what consciousness is, but one just lay way of talking about that is, what is consciousness? It's when the lights are on. It's when the lights are on. And the Buddha talks about that in the same way. Um, there are places in the canon where the Buddha talks about the mind being pabasara. This is one other word for uh, light. The Buddha talks about the mind is, is luminous or radiant. And this uh, concept is taken and expanded on to huge degree in Mahayana and Tibetan teachings. In the Pali context, it's just pointing to this capacity of awareness. Awareness, consciousness, this feeling that the lights are on uh, is a metaphor for how we experience the world. Whether our eyes are open or closed, awareness, when we're awake, when there's this buddho, this awaken, when the alarm clock has gone off and we've brought this level of awareness, we're participating in the capacity of awareness, then it feels like the lights are on. That's, that's what the Buddha is talking to. The, the mind is luminous in the sense that it, there is this capacity to know the lights can be on. And it really is up to us to participate in that awareness. I think a good case could be made that whether we are mindful or not, at any time, there is the capacity to be mindful, to be awake and alert. Even if I'm not paying attention to the feeling of my leg. If someone were to come along and I'm talking this way and they were to come and poke my leg, I wasn't paying attention to that. But the mind is still paying attention. There's this awareness that's going on somewhere, this capacity for consciousness that's picking up on the bodily, physical sensations. And similarly, the mind, there is this brightness of mind that's there and it's, it's up to us to participate in that, to uh, realize that that light is there. So that's the, the, the inner light, the pabasara chitta, the mind that's radiant, the mind that's, that's luminous. And I hope that people are able to um, experience that to some degree and 
um, yeah, to look and s- ask yourself maybe in what way is awareness like a, like a lamp, like a light? This is something when many people would go and hear the Buddha for the first time and he would give some like totally great teaching. He would just give like a great teaching. He did that like a lot. And uh, people would go and hear his teachings and then the person would just be totally blown away and they would say, it's just as if there was a lamp and it was turned on. So just as a lamp coming and being turned on in a dark room, so too uh, darkness has gone away and lightness has emerged. Ajahn Suwat, one of Ajahn Tanisaro's teachers, he talks about, uh, it's this kind of fascinating insight. It's as if you bring a light or a lamp or even a candle into a dark room and the darkness can't say, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, just wait a second. I've been here for a really long time. Uh, what are you doing? You know, you can't bring any light in here. Darkness can't do that. As soon as you bring the light into the room, you open up awareness, you bring some mindfulness um, to, you, to your life, participate in this capacity to know. And darkness is gone to the extent that it's gone in that moment. You're the... Uh, dimmer switch, you've turned it on, and hopefully all of us can do that in any moment, whether we like what's coming in through the eyes, ear, nose, tongue, body, still, we can turn on awareness and know that liking or know that disliking, know the brightness or know the darkness, whatever it is, that's the capacity of the mind, and that's what the Buddha talked about, and we can gradually, the more we keep the light on, the more our capacity for taking in light, giving off light, being the light, breathing the light, the more that gets turned up in our uh, inner brightness, inner light can just um, get brighter. So in the talk there, and yeah, look around for Kate. Hantamayang tamakata satu garang katamase satu Satu, satu, otami. Okay. Um, so we can open things up for questions or comments. Anybody can share your experience? Yeah, Christopher. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, my question briefly is about, um, or reflecting rather on what you mentioned about uh, the external light versus the internal light. And I love the analogy that you gave about the dimming. I find that when, um, as an artist myself, who has worked with light, <laughs> um, I find that as light permeates through an object, kind of like light through a prism, if you were simple put in that way. As light pierces through this thick material of substance, whether it's glass, whether whatever the material is, it doesn't really matter. What matters is how that light travels and bends the way that it's received from the object so when it reflects into the surface of the wall or whatever it's reflecting onto, it becomes a different level of awareness in that if we use a laser light, it's different than if we use an LED light versus if we use a white flashlight. All different light waves are all essentially photons and particles, all this other thing, but they all have their own different reaction to the material. And so, um, as I have this level of awareness of how light behaves physically in terms of physics, optics, perception, my perception changes when I what? When I no longer have to see the object of how the light responds to the material, but more about how in essence, when I sit down and I close my eyes and I no longer have to rely on how that intensity of that light is traveling to the object, but more about how 
I can imbue the light, meaning how I embody the light for myself as a dissipated great gradient of the way the light is imbued in me, not so much as it is in the object for my viewer to understand what I'm capturing in my photography, for example. I, I don't mean to get all wordy, but that's probably an, un, too much to go over, but that's kind of essentially what I feel like I resonated with what you shared. So I wanted to ask you, or not ask, but really reflect upon what you were sharing. Would you find that when we look at others outside of ourselves and we see ourselves in it, when we have, the, for example, a laser light hitting a piece of glass, it's gonna be a sharper um, bend, but it's gonna cause a sharper response back in any kind of way because it's startling. It's in the darkness that we see this. But in essence, I'll distill down, I'll, be, I'll, I'll calm down, but how can I imbue that so that I can know that when I'm in my imbued state or in my embodied state, that that light is pervasive through all? Yeah, I think one thing that you're doing with all of that reflection is just uh, being creative in the way that you hear and use that, this perception of light. I mean, really the Buddha, when he described it in these early suttas, it's so just the bare bones and all of us have to just add the flesh ourselves and figure out what's most meaningful for us. And yeah, is it an LED light? Is it a flame? Is it the sun? Is it, you know, all these different types of light. And um, I think one thing which is uh, maybe helpful um, is, yeah, just when the Buddha is finding that perception of light, he says that it goes just as above, just so below, so below, so above, same in the front, same in the back, back, front. And it's, that's just speaking to the radiant quality of light. If you've got a light, as long as it doesn't hit anything, it's just going to go in every direction. And even if it hits something, there's probably some photons that are going through it. But you don't actually need to do any of that. The Buddha said in a different discourse that there are four types of light. You've got the light of the moon, you've got the light of the sun, you've got the light of fire, and you've got the light of wisdom. And that light of wisdom, like you don't have to, you know, be cranking up the, the switch. You know, you don't have to be... You know, you don't have to do that. You can just, yeah, stay with, um, stay with the body, uh, your own perception of the body or whatever you're, stay with the breath, um, remembering your, your precepts, how you want to speak and engage with the world. When you keep this awareness present, then the light is just going to do what it, it does and you kind of just trust that. And that, things seem more natural that way when you, when we try to, you know, shine some, our own lasers, you know, shoot laser beams of loving kindness or somebody, you know, at somebody, it feels a bit artificial. You know, you can kind of do it uh, to some extent, but it just feels a little bit, a little bit off or too intense. And uh, yeah, I think just relaxing that is, is a good thing. So I think in essence, what sounds like what I got from what you just shared is that it's, it's an, it's an embodiment of the light that basically illuminates from within itself, it charges itself. And not the same way that the light is doing it physically through my perception, similarly, but it's more of an, uh, a gradient or a dimmer. It's more of an expansion of a softer, transmutable light that is per, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, work with it, work with it in that way. Yeah, especially embodied, like you were saying. Uh, I was told to keep it short, I will. Um, the uh, uh, reference you made to uh, Ajahn Dun Atulo's uh, reconfiguring of the Four Noble Truths, I, uh, I read that in the book you had here, and, and uh, I, I love that. It, it's such a simple, uh, useful uh, way of kind of understanding uh, the Four Noble Truths, but just how to behave uh, that I, I found very, very um, straightforward and, and useful. So thank you for that. Good. Glad to hear that. And the, the tie is just so simple. What is the path? It's mind seeing mind when this terms of light is just light knowing light or night, light, mind knowing mind, mind seeing mind. 
Okay, I, I just wanted to say something real quickly. Um, I guess it's the light of wisdom that I am cultivating to uh, help me to stay mindful when emotions, really, really strong old emotions knock me down, which has been happening a lot recently. So um, do you have any, any thoughts about that? About, you know, when, like, like I feel like I'd be enlightened today if it wasn't for my emotional <laughs> body. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I mean, it seems like you're doing what you can is just bringing awareness and some measure of light to, I mean, we can't control actually what moods come up from past conditions or what even to some degree, what thoughts are going to bubble up. I, I don't know what the next thought I'm going to have is or what the next mood I'm going to have is, but being able to know that and bring some awareness to it. Um, and then, yeah, trusting in that, that light of wisdom, a light of awareness. Um, it's almost like, believing in the almost disinfectant quality of light. Like you hang up in Thailand after we get back from Almas Round. It's walking in you know, early morning. The sun is coming out. We've got you know three or three layers of this type robe on and kind of getting sweaty. So we hang up our robes right after the, on a long laundry line and just let it be out in the sun for you know, five or 10 minutes. And yeah, it kind of, it dries up all that sweat and uh, yeah, just brings some level of, yeah, things don't fester. And um, yeah, when you are able to be mindful of the more turbulent moods that it is, they will be less, it, it is bringing some level of alleviation to the, the whole churning. Hello. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so I had a question for you. So at one point you were talking about um, shedding the light to the defilements like hatred or greed. And this is a question like I always had but never got a chance to ask. It's like whenever like there is hatred in me, there are ways that I can see it. Like if I feel anger, in my like emotional body or if there's a certain state of mind and same with greed like when i feel a certain type of desire um but when it comes to delusion that's something that i've never really understood because yeah it's like delusion like how, how do you even see that and how you shed light in that yeah no it's a it's a great question and Greed and anger are just, it's more clear even in their kind of subtle forms, but delusion is things are kind of sloppy and everything's all mixed up. And um, yeah, it's, it's like a dimmer uh, awareness that the capacity, I mean, it's, it's almost this conditioned experience of, of delusion or confusion, it does have some kind of effect, it seems, on our capacity to know it. And so, um, yeah, it seems harder to even turn on the light. The light seems to just go out by itself after uh, our capacity, to, both our capacity to turn on the light, to keep the light on, um, to keep the light going. It, it does diminish. So, I mean, something, you can prime the whole process just by practicing, you know, meditating before you get into this. For me, it's pretty reliable. Honestly, through the course of a day, it's like, say, like, peak mindfulness early in the morning, and then it goes like this. And then there's a little bit of a meal, and then it keeps going down, and then this is like, yeah, kind of handicapped after about 11 a.m. Um, <laughs> but knowing that, you know, I can create um, patterns. I can Myself and hopefully mo most people in this room have some degree of freedom in our lives to design um, many days or most days our structures and routines, at least to some level. So yeah, we've got a, a group meditation that we do from 5:15 or from 5 to 5:45 every day on Zoom. That is probably like my worst time or one of the worst, you know, low times of this deluded mind. But if I'm sitting with other people, even if it's just on Zoom. Uh, there's more instances of, okay, remembering turning the, the switch on even when it turns itself off. And um, yeah, 
kind of decreasing that tendency towards uh, yeah, the kind of sloppiness of, of confusion and delusion. And you can do other things throughout the rest of your day. Like if it, if it is the afternoon or if it's the morning, whenever it is, setting reminders on your phone or um, yeah, setting times to meet with your friends during those times. Um, just that's some way. Because if you switch, if you just follow your habits, um, that is what is going to lead to the same results. It's just more kind of delusion and, and darkness. But switch up your habits. Switch around the people who you see with, your bright friends, your Kalyana Mitta. Um, bring those into your life at those times. So that can help. Yep. I think this might be maybe two more questions. Yep. Yeah, the question is about you mentioned corrupt mind, so could you elaborate what that means and um, and why that would be? And would that still work if you, let's say, alone totally live somewhere in the desert, there's no one to relate to? Would that still work the same principle of corrupt mind, or would that be different because it's relative to... I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the... What was the principle of the... Uh, the the idea of corrupt mind versus not corrupt, and would that still work if you uh, if you don't have anyone to relate? Meaning that you're totally, let's say, living in a desert. There's no one there, right? There would be no relationships. Would that principle of corrupt corrupt mind would would it still work? And why? Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, Yet yeah, somewhat, it can be like a triggering word even to even talk about the mind being corrupt or um, yeah, defiled is it, even is another word that you sometimes hear in Buddhist circles. Uh, the word is paduta in that Dhammapada verse. And yeah, it does refer to this non-bright. It's in counter distinction to this pasana citta, the mind that is, that's bright, that has this degree of lightness to it. It's a mind that um, yeah, is obscured. It's like um, there's the sun, and it's been obscured by rain clouds, or so. That's the padutam, that's the corrupt. It's corrupt in the sense that uh, our, if we're a little person on the earth and a rain cloud comes up, our view of the higher heavens, of the higher skies have been, it's been corrupted in a sense. Um, but yeah, the sky is still there. Um, there's not actually a problem, and this is what we were just talking about, this third foundation of mindfulness, when you mind knowing mind, one knows the mind of craving or the mind of anger as a mind of craving or anger. One knows the deluded mind as a deluded mind, or one knows the undiluted, non-craving, non-aversive mind as undiluted, not craving, not aversive. So it's almost like you bring a meta single T or double T, like a kind of you shift your awareness to a higher a higher level of knowing or just yeah, shift your awareness from the cloud, that passing corruption of how I think the world should be in my view of light to the whole sky. Um, so if, yeah, if you're in the middle of the desert, if you're totally by yourself, um, you can do it, but just reading into the question a little bit, having friends on the path, the Buddha said, these Kalyana Mitta, Mitta's friends, Kalyana is that which is beautiful. So beautiful friendship, noble friendship, um, spiritual friendship. The Buddha said that's the whole of the holy life. So it is, it is really helpful to have people who mirror our own capacity for light or just show us a whole other vista of what a human mind can be like. You hang around these monasteries or hopefully, I mean, you don't have to go to a monastery. You don't have to go to any place Buddhist. You just look around in your life, hopefully, and you see there's a range of, how else do you describe it, but kind of the brightness of, of people. Um, yeah, I mean, you could talk about it in terms of auras, but just this inner light that different people have, whatever the religion or no religion, and um, yeah, having people who are have what we want, you know, people who are are kind of bring that brightness and lightness to uh, to the world. Hanging around those people, it kind of rubs off a little bit. We get some of that lightness, and yeah, hope that hope that addressed it some way. I enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a follow-up question on the, the nature of delusion and recognizing it. Um, 
You talked about every time the mind going out that we invite suffering in, can it also be said that every time the mind goes out, we are partaking in delusion? So what was the first part of that? The so you, you talked about, uh, you know, every time the mind goes out, yeah. we are potentially inviting suffering. Yeah. Uh, so every time the mind goes out, can it also be said that we are partaking in delusion? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a good way to put it. And that the Buddha does use those words. Tama is the word for dark, darkness. And moha, delusion, they can be almost synonymous. So yeah, the mind that goes out is uh, the cause of suffering. The mind that goes out is the cause of delusion. Delusion is the cause of suffering. Delusion and suffering are almost almost synonymous, almost just different angles on the same mental phenomena, in a sense. Yeah, interesting.